And just as we go live, one of them walks away. <laughs> All right, Mr. Joe, can you, can you quickly show the shirt? Oh, yeah, we can do the shirt. We got number 16. It's yeah, a bi yeah. big day for you today. It's a big day, man. I'll take whatever I can get. I usually sleep in my jerseys. Just kidding. But, uh, you know, I'm really excited about today's game. Last week's game was insane. You know, the walk-off field goals. Not just the Niners game, but all of the games last weekend were crazy. Football is a, you know, it's pretty amazing sport. I love baseball. I love sports in general. Um, you know, I'm not much of a gambler, but I do love my Bay Area teams. I was kind of raised to support the local team. So I'm not just a Giants fan. I'm an A's fan and a Giants fan. I think my father talked to me when I was younger about uh, the sports teams, how they bring in money for the economy. He, he had a talk with me when I was really young and probably, probably like 12 or 13. And I still kind of remember him talking about how sports teams bring in money for the local economy. And he was talking about the Giants and the A's. I bet he, he doesn't even remember the conversation, but I vividly do. Um, and so I support the A's, the Giants, the Sharks, uh, the Niners. You know, when the, when the Raiders were here, I'm very supportive of the Raiders, all these things, because they bring money into the local economy. So I think that's a positive thing for sports. Regardless of how you look at it, I, I think it's a good thing. So what are you thinking about this weekend, Peter? I'd love to see the Bengals win. Yeah. And uh, I guess I'm in – yeah, no, I guess, I mean, it'd be fun to see the Niners uh, go. I mean, I, I actually, I, I like Matt Stafford. I mean, I'm, uh, my mom, I think, uh, either yesterday or the day before asked me if I've started to like LA sports teams. And I was like, no, <laughs> so I'm, I'm all new England all the time. So like when I lived in New York, I hated the Yankees. Uh, I hate the Lakers. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's lots of ways to look at it, but uh, definitely. So we got a really awesome show today. I'm really excited uh, to kind of talk about our guests. Uh, we have my friend Gordon, who's going to be on here. He's also a business partner uh, with a company called Cultivar Alliance, and we're going to be talking about some cool breeding stuff that Gordon's been doing over the years. Uh, especially population outcrossing. And then we've got Jamal, Steve, and Grasshopper. Uh, they are from the East Bay Seed Collective. And Jamal is from uh, Eile Seeds. And I'm not sure about the other guys' seed companies. But we're going to be talking about land race stuff with them. So, Gordon, do you have a couple minutes to tell us a little bit about yourself and your history with breeding? Yeah, so... Uh... Let's see where to start. Um, I uh, I guess I'll start. Uh, I dropped out of high school when I was 16 because I was looking for a better education, honestly. And I decided that I was interested in farming and uh, that there were a lot of reasons, uh, you know, a lot of, I guess, primarily social activism reasons to be involved in farming. And um, so I started doing farm apprenticeships at that time, uh, worked on a whole variety of different farms, um, everything from dairying and logging to specialty greens and seeds. Um, and, um, and then uh, I guess in my early 20s, I met the woman who would become my wife and is still my wife, uh, Rowan White. And uh, the two of us uh, found that we were really in love with seed. And uh, so we have been uh, seed stewards uh, since that time, which is a little over 20 years now. Um, and so we, I mean, just here on our own farm, we maintain a collection of, I honestly don't know what the count is at this point in time, but it's somewhere mm, probably getting close to 400 different varieties uh, that we keep and maintain here. Um, and uh, so, you know, 
if you're going to take care of seed, you know, then, uh, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of selection that will take place, uh, either consciously or unconsciously. And, uh, and so we try to be conscious of, uh, of the selections that we do um in how we maintain our populations um and our seed lots and uh so then all of a sudden that is plant breeding um uh once you once you start recognizing uh you know i mean that's kind of in its its most elemental form um and so now over the years we have uh you know continue to educate ourselves uh you know quite a bit um and and uh so back about 15 years or so ago 15 16 years now i um i started applying some of that uh knowledge and those practices uh with cannabis as well and uh you know and so i i think that's part of why i'm in the conversation today uh for me that process started with population outcrossing um that um seems like a very important uh practice in general in the in the plant breeding world but uh you know, particularly when we're talking about uh, starting with very small quantities of seed or genetic lines that have, uh, you know, that just have, that have small populations that have been, uh, you know, where there's been a lot of uh, inbreeding or very aggressive um, pedigree breeding approaches. Um, you know that's any any time where you're really narrowing the genetic funnel um yes you can get some uh you know some some dramatic uh results from doing that you can get some outstanding cultivars um but there is also uh you know a, a certain weakening that can take place in that process uh by limiting uh, genetic diversity and, you know, going into a more, uh, you know, like a more vertical approach to plant breeding. Uh, and I am of the school of thought that, uh, that I prefer the, uh, the horizontal approach to, uh, to breeding, which is, uh, you know, greater diversity, um, you know, moving, moving in a direction of more like heterozygosity than homozygosity. And uh, so that uh, now I'm, I'm, I should make the caveat on that. I'm not opposed to, uh, you know, to vertical or pedigree breeding. Um, but I think that any responsible seed steward also needs to, um, to keep a mind for, uh, what we have inherited in the form of seeds. Uh, these are the, the processes of, uh, really countless generations of, uh, human interaction with our plant relatives and um and if we're just looking for what traits or attributes uh are applicable for our uh current day and age uh then we are we're we're acting without awareness to perhaps the magnitude of uh, the value of that inheritance um, as in like what it would take to make all of that again from scratch is uh, again, you're talking about countless generations. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, so, so we have a certain obligation 
from my perspective, we have a certain obligation to uh, to be responsible stewards um, to uh, to all of this genetic diversity, which is brought about by you know all these all these human generations, all these human hands, all this uh, involvement uh, that we that we have uh, with these plants, and so uh, so population outcrossing um or you know uh, open pollinated uh seed lots are uh i think essential uh to maintain and so when i started working with uh cannabis um i applied really the same approach that i would uh in working with um you know a seed lot because we do we do a lot of seed restoration here uh uh with particularly a lot of uh you know indigenous native american crop varietals um and um so it is not uncommon for us to get a very small lot as in you know maybe uh 6 or 12 or 20 seeds of say a corn uh that is very um you know very endangered and um and so what we will do with that uh is you know it is a pro a, a process of restoration uh that takes several generations to uh you know to to revitalize a uh a population and we're not doing any uh selection um or as you know i guess you're always doing a certain amount of selection if you depending on how you want to define that term but um as minimally as possible uh to try and uh sort of reopen the uh the doors of genetic possibility so maybe that's a good start. Yeah, I think that's a good start. And maybe uh, discussing on the most basic term, what is population outcrossing and how is it done? If you have six seeds, how do you go about taking six seeds and using those six seeds to, to increase the genetic diversity and do some outcrossing? What would your approach be? Uh, okay, so basically, I mean, it, it depends on, you know, I guess which six seeds you have, um, you know, in the in the uh in the instance of cannabis you know we're talking about a dioecious plant so we have you know we have individual you know like male and female are two distinct plants uh you know uh as opposed to say corn which uh which is not where the the male and female uh flowers occur on the on the same plant um so in dealing with uh with cannabis in that way um what what i would do is that i would germinate uh those seeds and i would create an environment where they can uh you know where they can engage in their reproductive lifestyle you know so that they can you know they can uh they can pollinate each other um and so you know, at that point in time, I'm not, oh, there's my rooster uh, joining in on the conversation. Uh, nice. They can, um, you know, I get, okay, so basically at that point in time, we're not doing any selection. We're not doing any stem rubs or uh, anything where we're trying to identify either on the male side or the female side who we want uh, to produce seed from. Uh, we are allowing them to reproduce naturally without any selection. And so that's, you know, that's, that's the first generation of doing that. Um, and then because we are starting with such a narrow uh, band of the spectrum of whatever that 
seed lines heritage is wherever that seed line comes from uh you know if if there's only six seeds that make it into our hands then um you know that's that that's a very uh narrow band so we want to then take that uh that outcrossing process and we want to repeat that uh through several generations and we want to try and build up to larger and larger populations uh in the process of doing that so you know as anybody who works with seeds knows it's like you know you can start with one or you know six uh and uh and and they multiply exponentially um so even though you're starting with six you can uh you know in your second generation you could be in a position where you're looking at doing you know two or three or four or five hundred uh seeds just from that initial cross and um and then repeating that process again now you're going to uh, a much larger population and you're allowing the uh the expression of a much broader you know swath of that spectrum uh so you get to see uh you know some of the uh the other traits that are carried in that line you get to see uh some of the combinations uh some of the expressions of you know like you know double recessive traits or that kind of thing uh so that's really um you know that and there's also another element to that, which is that in order for cannabis to remain healthy, and usually when I talk about this with people, I'm like, cannabis is a lot like people, you know, uh, we are also uh, diaceous in that regard is that, you know, it takes a man and a woman, uh, we do not, uh, we, we cannot reproduce independently. And just like people uh if you are reproducing in a very small population you're getting into inbreeding uh and you know i mean we've and, and i mean we've seen that in in human populations i mean that's like a sort of classically uh royal approach to it where you know the 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 brother and the sister will marry uh to keep power consolidated within the family and uh and after several generations of that happening you end up with uh you know some of the like genetic diseases that have run through uh those family lines and cannabis is the same way uh so being able to uh to you know have that greater diversity uh of potential matches um is is really like an essential aspect of the health of any given cannabis seed line uh so you know population outcrossing i guess very simply put is just the uh you know the maintenance of that uh diverse population so that you are not ending up with inbreeding depression right perfect yeah i mean on a side note there are monoecious i know somebody's going to say it in the chat so i'm going to beat them to the punch but there are monoecious cannabis plants uh there, there are, are indeed yep it, it can be both monoecious and dioecious um, yes. i think even the monoecious side we can we can trace it back to like southeastern asia um, and so that is something that's been bred into the lines, um, probably by accident, I would say. I think most people wouldn't want to work with stuff that's monoecious, uh, unless they're working with maybe like trying to get hemp seed and doing a combination of things. But cannabis can be both, but dioecious is what we're trying to achieve, and we're trying to breed out those things, but they also show up as recessive traits. So sometimes, until you have recessive on both sides, it doesn't express. So they, they can pass for multiple generations and then you cross them with something and all of a sudden, wow, either cross them within itself and it, it basically 
uh, in, a, in a inbred line, you can get it, or even a, you know in an F1, you can get it. I mean, there's several ways mm-hmm. that you can get those. But yeah, I mean, I think the idea with population outcrossing, you you can take two ge- separate genetics and, and do population outcrossing as well by crossing them together uh, in search of recessive traits and diversity. And yes. Yeah, and yeah, I, I there, like there, 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 there's definitely exceptions uh, to those rules, really, like across uh, all, you know, like all these different plant species. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm, domesticates, anyways. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's always the exception to prove the rule, of course. Um, mm-hmm. But then there's also the aspect of it that, uh, for most of us who are involved uh, in working with cannabis, uh, that uh that hermaphroditic or monaceous tendency is uh is not a desirable trait no it's a it's Um, an undesirable intersexual trait and steve i'm glad to have you on uh nice to meet you i've heard good things thank you for having me thank you nice to be here so we'll jump into some introductions with these guys gordon just real quickly and uh if they want to jump into the conversation but yeah, Steve, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Oh, sure. I'm definitely, I would consider myself more on the art side than the science side of things. Um, although I've been working with the plant for probably 30 years now. So I've been um, making crosses and having fun, basically. And not until about the last 10 years have I really started to take breeding seriously. I wouldn't call myself a breeder, but just more conscientious about what I'm crossing, um, where I'm sourcing things from. And um, I'm in a place where I'm able to grow outdoors now. So I've had a lot of issues. I have great environment here, but I have a lot of humidity in the morning. So I've had a lot of PM issues with a lot of different strains. And so I've I've worked with a lot of chems and I mean, I'm still, I'm old school. I'm still looking for skunk in a way, but. Right. I um, think we all are in, in a way for sure. Yeah. Um, and to the point where I'm trying to reverse engineer it by just working with, that's one of the things that has drawn me towards more land race, equatorial, South American um, sativas, just working with a lot of Colombians. And um, this year it was a lot of Panama red and um some different uh like punta rojo and um acapulco gold a lot of you know those classics and just kind of first doing an open pollination basically preserving each line like that and then um, about to do some crosses with them and i I just found them to be really hardy really stable um, yeah really stable and just almost they're so fun to grow because they're they're like Jurassic almost. They're, it's just like something you've, I, it's something I've never witnessed. You know, this year some of these plants were just amazing. So one of those cool things about working with high humidity regions or regions that are uh, prone to powdery mildew or botrytis, you can actually select for things that are resistant to it. I think a lot of people hate on having to grow coastal, but in some ways there's benefits. To growing coastal, such as you know, being able to select for powdery mildew, obvious botrytis and powdery mildew resistant. When you know you have a population and there's only a handful of those varieties, it's real easy to pick out the ones that don't get powdery mildew. Yeah, so I've I've experienced that this year with uh, one plant just laying on top of another plant that that was just covered in powdery mildew, and the one the the Congolese red just nothing, just rock solid. Awesome. And I let that plant go till late December, like multiple rains, and just <laughs> just didn't even bother it. it. Finished really well. So we got Jamal here too. How you doing, Jamal? Jamal's been on the show before. You guys remember Jamal? Hey, I'm well, James. How are you? Fantastic. So you've done a lot in the last year. I think you got some gray hair too that you didn't have. Yeah. So <laughs> actually, shoot, in the last year, I've had a kid. Um and uh moved into a new house and done a lot of breeding um yeah congratulations yeah yeah, why don't you talk about what you've done in the last year uh eily seeds you want to give us a little uh introduction on yourself for those of you that don't remember jamal 
Sure. My name is Jamal. I'm the head of uh, eSpace Seed Collective, or I'm the founding member. What eSpace Seed Collective is, it's a collective of like-minded people who are into uh, heirloom and land race preservation, and we're just general strain nerds. We meet twice a month, and we talk about genetics. We talk about various podcasts, uh, such as The James Loud Show, um, episodes like Hoplite and Virus, and you know mainly genetics. And we debate, we study. Um, but yeah, the three main tenets of our group is one, we are developing a seed library of land race and heirloom genetics. And I kind of like the term heirloom because a lot of times in our group, we will debate the term land race for hours. Um, and so I, I use like point of origin or heirloom genetics, which are, you know, genetics that are from a specific location and that aren't heavily hybridized. Um, the other things that we do is we also have barbecues um that are also seed swaps which are super fun we eat a lot of good food trade seeds and smoke down um yeah that's uh that's what i that's what uh, east bay seed collective is about this past year i've done um some cool breeding and you know for me the main part of breeding which is a lot of what i've learned from you james is is really growing and learning the strength and figuring out what is worth breeding and for land race genetics or heirloom genetics a lot of it is learning for yourself because most many people nowadays have not grown panama red have not grown congolese have not grown punta roja and don't know what the strengths and weaknesses are of these genetics so for me, my latest joy is really diving into these genetics, growing them, making crosses with them, um, but, but mainly growing them and smoking it and figuring out what the strengths and weaknesses are of these specific genetics. Uh, something really priceless that I've learned from a Grasshopper, who's one of our members who's you know, on, this, on this thing, is um, this podcast, is you know, really being selective especially with land race or heirloom genetics being selective of if you're using a male or a female because the males and the females bring very different things to the table and you can degrade a genetic if you don't choose the right parent for that if you cho don't choose the right pairing and you do need to be very selective with your with your selections and you know, it's okay to grow out a bunch of things and decide that it's, you know, not worth putting forward. So, so this past year, I've just really, I've learned to be ultra, ultra picky and mega focused because, you know, in our group, there's so many genetics flying around. People have all this stuff that's really awesome. But as I'm, you know, really becoming a breeder, I'm learning that these are long-term relationships that you're developing with these genetics and you know once you've made a couple steps forward you know you can't really change your mind decide to move another direction like you really need to make the right choice and kind of now what i'm realizing it's very similar to a relationship with the human you know in that you really need to learn from your past relationships and be very selective and then when you are really selective and you are really focused on what you're doing, you can really have some awesome things. And when you're able to make a specific combination that has these particular traits you're looking for, just like a really valuable friend, it, it's, you know, it's so valuable. And now, especially with this group, when you have specific characteristics, the main thing that I almost really like is instead of discovering characteristics for myself, discovering characteristics for my other club members. So like, I'll find a, a strain that does a specific thing and a certain member, I'm like, man, you got to have this. This is for you. This isn't really for me or it's okay, but for your particular setup, you know, it, it will work. Um, so, you know, I'm now um, actually today, our website is launched for Eileen Seeds. So, you know, we're starting to sell seeds. Um, but I mean, the main part of the journey is just really, you know, truly diving into what it is to look into these genetics and to like basically shepherd them in specific directions. Totally. I think what's good is so subjective to the individual. It's a, it's amazing. What, what I think is good and what 
other people think is good is sometimes very different. I think I have a group of friends and I think we're all very like-minded on what we think is good. And sometimes it has nothing to do the way with the way it looks. It has to do with the smell, the taste and the effect. Uh, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But as far as for breeding, for commercial application, that can be a different thing. So there's so many different approaches you can have. And it's so cannabis is so subjective, just like food and all these other things. Some people like pizza. Some people don't like pizza. But yeah, breeding is it's, it's you're you're learning, though, though, you know, it's a lifelong thing. You know, that's we were talking about master growers the other day. And it's like you don't really master growing ever. Like you, you get to a certain point where you know how to grow well. And you know how to, but you, you're constantly learning in the, especially with indoor cultivation is constantly evolving. I but we got grasshopper on. So let's talk to grasshopper for a second. I've been uh, waiting to talk to grasshopper. How you doing grasshopper? Hey James. Um, Man, thank yeah. you for coming on. Yeah. Thank you guys too for having me. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So uh, let me see where I start. Um, you know, first, I'm grateful for, you know, for all the information that you guys provide on this show. You know, that was how I was able to meet um, Jamal and became a part of his seed collective. And, you know, I could go back, say, you know, my experience with the plant is over 30 years. Um, have a lot of experience in equatorial. So I did a 10 years in, around the equator and that type of sativa growing and breeding for a long time about 10 years of that and then migrated here about 25 years ago 20 something years ago and um my first experience with indoors here was uh it, taking a trip to colorado to visit some friends and that's where i saw the cough that you know back then they say it came from connecticut um i saw williams wonder i saw a big skunk and all of these amazing plants grown indoor in colorado which was amazing. And then I came back to the Bay Area because I, I had traveled to Colorado from the Bay Area. I came back to the Bay Area and um, kind of started my little indoor venture and, you know, started out with Super Skunk, Ultra Skunk, and one of Ed Rosenthal's strain called Max 49, which I thought was cool back then, you know, and then my experience just grew from there on with with you know um having getting that cough over from colorado out here and produced it for a long time for the the cannabis dispensaries or the what you would refer to back then as um, medical dispensaries right yeah. and i had a, a good experience with some of the older strains like the chem dogs the ramelins the california oranges you know. calio that takes forever did, did you grow calio as well yeah, I grew Calio. I grew Calio uh, in like Earth uh, 20 years ago, 21. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. How many weeks was the Calio that you were growing? Was it like a it 16? A, like, no, it was like, it was an indica short flower. Huh. Range. They were eight, nine weeker. Yeah, I have friends that grew a Calio that was six, 16 to 18. And one of my friends, he took it. He, he's he since passed, but he took it 20 weeks and it, it was amazing stuff, but it would take forever. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, there's some great Bay Area strains. You mentioned Romulan. Uh, you know, I think there, there was a, a bunch of them around that time. You know, we were starting to get European stuff as well. Um, you know, Power Plant. We were seeing Power Plant in the Bay Area. Uh, Super Silver Haze, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Super Silver was, you know, we did... The super silver one, we could not get the cough. The cough was an excellent plant. I mean, NL5 is if you flower it to 10, and then when we flower it to 12, we would call it the cough because it's a whole different experience. Um, you know, and having those experience with those plants and and, and losing those plants and, and, and thinking that I'm just going to go back to the club and grab a Calio cut. You know, so I, I let them go for a while and I went back and grabbed the cuts again and realized that, oh, there is different things going on here. It's a whole different cut. It's not all the same. You know, and losing the Ramelan and losing the Calio and a couple of the different chem dogs and stuff. Um, that was where I decided to start holding on to stuff. And that's, you know, I held on to the Urkel. I held on to the Florida OG because I, those things I had got from 
from the hemp center that was you know i don't want to be name dropping here but you know um, sure Turner and those guys used to work at the same facility that i grew for um so i had you know i was growing the cough and some morning glory for them at that time and um they had uh offered me these trains and that's how i end up with that florida og which i understand is the one of the parents of the cookie and um and that's why i ended up with the Urkel and you know and then you know my mango is pretty unique i had that since like 2006 it's a cut of a mango that's not circulated um i think it's an old kc brand you know there's an old hippie dude up in um mendo that um we used to get pounds of it from he wouldn't give us a clone but in that pound we found a, a seed and you know grew that out and that's the cut the cuts of that i've been keeping ever since and that was just as good as what we were getting from him back then um yeah you know times move forward you know the cookie came on the scene the urkels and then you know the cherry pie and then i kept the cherry pie the urkel uh the mango and that florida og and those guys kind of, has kind of been the basis of a lot of the breeding that i do trying to get those into seed forms back then so i did a lot of back crossing of them you know, I started to sell them recently. And yeah, it's just been a journey. And, you know, had had a case in San Francisco at the same time Ed Rosenthal has his case here. I had some experience working for Jack Herrer for a while. Um, nice. And also, um, you know, um, did a demonstration in Golden Gate Park planting 2001 cannabis plant as a part of a demonstration on the TV, police, police personnel, the news, so, you know, been here for a while, kind of contributing to or doing my part, you know, to the freedom and the liberation of the plant itself. Um, and that's always been one of my passions. And, you know, moving forward, work my way into the regulated space and not having so much fun with it at all, but I'm here. <laughs> and um, um, what else can I touch on? A lot of, and I've gathered a lot of strains over the years. Like, you know, I have family all over the world, especially in Africa and um, and stuff. So I keep getting most of the, most of my, what I would call land races or what people refer to as land races. Um, I, my experience with them is, is that I try to get them from source, from family who have been, who understands them. You know, because, you know, everybody could get some stuff from Swazi and say, oh, I got Swazi, oh, I got, but, you know, they're right. not, they're not what the people in Swazi are smoking or they're not what the people in Central America or Colombia or even Mexico, like, like, I, for instance, the show you did on the, on the, on the on live from Mexico and they talk about how the narco stuff only makes it here and then that real small batch stuff gets shared around the current series of those countries. Um, so yeah. I'm kind of kind of very reserved to grab a lot of the stuff that we see online when it comes to land races and stuff, um, because a lot of them are not very appealing to me from my experience um, with with equatorial strains. There are some really good ones. I mean, it's yet sure. to, it's yet to, I, being here for 25 years, I've experienced some really great herbs, um, but, you know, I could say the same for 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 you know the equi equatorial zones to have experienced a really great herb you know if I right. smoke that, if we smoke that herb the way we smoke herb here you're sleeping by five o'clock in the afternoon you're done for the day so someone said bless orange hill and uh orange hill is from jamaica i don't know if you've ever had the orange hill but that stuff will knock your ass out it's but it's it's unique flavor profile super strong some of the strongest yeah. weed i've ever smoked in my life um <laughs> Yeah, Orange but, Hill from the yeah. island, more Central America area. So I've I've, I've experienced yeah. like what Bodhi talks about. Bodhi talks right. about it. so from from like Lake Isabel, Guatemala, and those area, and I've experienced those things, and um, you know those are pretty unique and and the diversity, man. I mean, it seems like within all of these countries, there's a certain population or a certain part of the society that really deals with herb on a level where, you know, can be compared to the same way we appreciate it here and, and look at it here. 
Um, yeah, it, and uh, I think on, on that note, we can talk a little bit about Europe. And I think the there's a big misconception on equatorial varieties being terpenoline limonene dominant that are just that haze, what, what I think a lot of people know is haze flavor, uh, like with the train wreck, um, stuff like that. There's a lemon meringue train wreck, all these things that have that are heavy dominant with the terpenoline and limonene. And, you know, that's from bottlenecking. That's not actual expression of the true diversity of these genetics that come from the equatorial, you know, I mean, even going into some of the tropical stuff that gets, but I would say the equatorial, you know, there's this depression that's gone on. And most people in the world, if you go to Europe, if you go to the United States or other countries, when they think of equatorial, they think of haze. And haze is part of it, definitely. You know, that's an expression like the Colombian definitely has that. It's it's heavy with the terpenoline limonene, but that's not all there is. And so, you know, having Gordon on here, this kind of ties it all in together. But, you know, the genetic diversity, when we start bottlenecking, we get stuck with a small population and very little diversity when there's so much stuff to be able to work with and to be able to use as medicine and other things like that. So do one of you guys want to touch on that? As far as, uh, as far as the difference, well, I, I do agree with what you're saying when it comes to sativas. Uh, um, it's not strictly limonene and, and, and uh, Jack Terps that everybody would refer to. Um, of my experience with them is that they could be pretty floral and you know and like for instance you look at a, a strain like the durban itself the pure durban um there's some licorice and some anise and some mild floral tones going on in those genetics and you know they're outside of outside of the lemonine regular earthy smelling and those are the ones i try to get away from um as far as you know they're very common and i have a lot of friends that breed sativas as well but you know those are not the sativas that i'm focused on as far as for breeding purposes they 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 do have a lot of good medicine um we cross a gelato with an angola black by a colombian by an angola red colombian black and you know and there was stuff coming out of there with 13 percent thc uh Six percent CBD, uh, six. I mean, sorry, thirteen percent CBD, six percent uh, uh, THC, like two to ones and stuff like that. So there were some interesting, you know, a lot of medicinal properties within them, and and they breed dominant for those properties as well, from what I see. Um, you know, when you have a 25 percent female yeah. and hit it with a with one of those. Uh, land race type or equatorial type what you end up with is it not to thc sometimes two to one cbd to thc or in those yeah. area progeny so i do agree they have great medicinal properties as far as all the other cannabinoids that we don't really focus on these days sure yeah there's tons of stuff that isn't being focused on and and even more stuff that's in such small uh, amounts in a plant that unless you're using lab equipment, you wouldn't even be able to identify it. And I think there's, you know, I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible with medicine, you know, as far as drug discovery and everything else. And we're going to find it. We're not going to find that in the populations of stuff we already have. We're going to find that in uh, the outcrosses that occur over time or, or, uh, you know, some of the heirloom or maybe even feral genetics, um, you know, the, the feral just stuff is pretty much going away, but, but there's, it still exists out there. Same thing with the land races. I mean, I hear people saying the land races are gone. It's not true. You know, people have hybridized versions and they're, they're not completely gone. There's people, there's stewards, there's people like Gordon and the other guys on the show that are stewards of the plant that have been saving stuff for years. I have a seed collection and I've always said something like uh, the value of a seed is in its use and not in its possession, but it's, it's a combination of stuff. If, if you're not going to use it, it's worth nothing, you know? So uh, I guess, you know, you, you want to talk a little bit about land races, Jamal, and the difference between land race, feral, and I know we've had this conversation before, so I think. Sure, sure. So, I mean, essentially my my take on it is that a feral plant is one that has 
very little to no human interaction with it or human um, watering of sorts. What I've what I've read or what I've heard is that there's common feral plants that are on the perimeters of commercial, um, I guess would be hemp, and that the feral stuff kind of would be on on the side and just kind of is able to survive what they call consider ditch weed. And then an heirloom would be um, a genetic that has is is in a specific location. That location is usually isolated and that population is not being mixed with other populations. And so year after year, people are growing a specific cultivar and they're self-pollinating and just continuing with that genetic. Uh, you know, for us as a group, like we kind of debate regarding, or I often debate regarding if all genetics are worth saving and if all, if all cultivars are worth crossing with. Um, some genetics are really rough and the amount of work that you have to do to bring it to something commercial is quite a bit of work. There are other cultivars that are a little bit closer to, you know, our needs or what we might be looking for. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of what kind of we debate or talk about is, you know, which particular, which particular heirlooms are worth preserving. You know, that's, that's my main thing because, you know, we can't just preserve them all. We don't have that amount of time. And so it's really about pinpointing specific traits that we're looking to, to move from one genetic into another and finding those specific traits in, in genetics and, you know, looking into it further in that way. And, you know, like the more you really try to do it properly, it gets to be a little bit overwhelming. And that's kind of why the group is so cool is that we're able to pick different things and share them with each other. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's cool. You guys have an amazing group. Uh, Gordon and I are going to have to stop by one of these days. But oh, you know, yeah. And you know, what's, cool is that, what's cool is it's, it's uh, you know, the meetings are on, on Zoom. And so. Oh, wow. You know, and so. We'll, we'll definitely have to oh. stop by on Zoom one of these days. Yeah, And, you That'd know, the, the conversations that we have are, are really interesting and pretty dorky at times, but. It's, it's very similar to these podcasts. It's just kind of like a deeper dive into these particular subjects. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, I can dork out on those conversations for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> for sure. Uh, it, yeah, it is, it, is, uh, it is kind of dorky, but if it's something that you're interested in, uh, then it's really engaging, um, it, you know. And one thing, one thing that I, I wanted, to, to, wanted to share was um, just when you were talking about like, um, typically people think that their, uh, that their heirloom genetics are going to be a specific terpene profile. I have three different things here. They're all completely different smelling. So here's the Punta Roja. And initially it smells like you're drinking from a juice box or that you're sucking in the air from a juice box. Um, and then as it dries and as it cures, it really starts to change to something, something a little bit more complex. The other one, which is from Steve, is the um, red, excuse me, this is the uh, red, Panama red by Congolese. And I get a little bit of grass from this one. Um, and I find that the ones that actually have the most grassy terpene profile, which a lot of people don't really like, I find have the best high. So it's kind of this fight between... Mm -hmm things that are really tasty and kind of sleepy and things that really get you going, but have this kind of grassy, not as ideal flavor to them. And then the last one is this super larfy Burmese. And you would totally assume that this would be some not good cannabis, but it's actually extremely strong, very grassy flavored, and for me, the most interesting part about this is you really get to feel what cannabis feels like without the indica influence onto it, um, mm. which is, you know, not something that we commonly get a chance to experience. Nice. That's awesome. I would love to experience those. That's, that's great. I got some weed to trade for sure, too. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to talk today a little bit about sour diesel. That's something that's very close to my heart. And Gordon and I had a conversation about it the other day. And 
I know it's something that's close to his heart as well, and he's done a lot of work with Sour. So, Gordon, you want to tell us a little bit about your uh, history with Sour Diesel and kind of the, the work you've done with Sour over the years? Uh, yeah, so uh, Sour Diesel, uh, I mean, is, is one that I've been uh, been cultivating here, yeah, over 15 years now. Um uh, originally a cut that we got from some friends out in Mendo. Um, and I used, um, a, uh, well, I, I, I started, uh, I started all this off, uh, you know, at that, at that time, uh, I was primarily growing, uh, some OG, and uh some sour and so i had a garden in which it was only those two and uh and so there was a uh you know sour uh would sometimes express that uh hermaphroditic tendency and uh and so we uh, came across a little bit of bag seed in the trimming process. And uh, interestingly, uh, so the, the bag seed that we came across was from some OG. Um, and uh, amazingly enough, I got a male seed um, in that process. There was, you know, a small handful and uh, I, I germinated them and there was a singular male um and so that was uh then i took that and uh and started uh i with that mail i did a, a pollination again of that sour and that og and uh and then i took the resultant seeds from that cross and i started a uh, population outcrossing program that went through. Uh, so I did four generations uh, of population outcrossing um, before I did any kind of, uh, you know, any kind of selection uh, at all. And so, and typically those were in populations of between like, two and probably 400 uh you know uh individual phenotypes between you know in in each uh population outcross um so then subsequently from there i've i've gone you know i, I i've done uh some some selections within that line um and really uh when it comes to anything that i'm uh using as a pollen source on any breeding that i'm doing at this point in time somewhere back in that lineage uh unless it's something totally new to me uh but <laughs> even still at this point like everything has uh some of that in there uh so um, but I guess in the, the population outcrossing side of it, one of the reasons that I chose to, to go that way, you know, uh, you know, there's like, uh, stability and, uh, increasing, uh, the genetic diversity, uh, within the gene pool, but it's also like, there's an aspect of it where I think about it of just kind of, you know, opening up this treasure trove. You know, you're 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 opening the 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 doors to see all these aspects of of potential, um, and so what you know what I have found in the process of doing that uh, are uh, you know terpene profiles or morphological expressions like all these different uh, attributes that if i were to show you this particular you know phenotype you would never guess uh that that comes out of a line that is just sour and og um and you know i think that that's uh 
I think that that's a, a, a really important uh, aspect of all of these, you know, all of these plant lines and, and seeds that are, are, you know, that, that, that we care about, that we have relationships, that we are, you know, we're, we're, we're engaged in like a symbiosis. And, um, you know, and as that applies to like, you know, the seed market or the flower market, like commercial viability, like that's really only one aspect uh, of, of that relationship. And it's not, a, it's not even necessarily an essential aspect of that relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, particularly when you're talking about uh, global heirlooms or land race varietals, uh, you know, a lot of those seed lines have been preserved without that consideration even necessarily being part of the equation at all. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think that it's important to keep that in perspective is that, the, you know, the, the commercial market is really just one, is one lens to look through. Um, you know, but when you're, you know, talking about like grassy profiles or super larfy structure, um, you know, uh, yeah, in, in, in terms of the, the, you know, when, when looking through the lens of, uh, of commercialization, those things look totally undesirable. But if you put on maybe some different lenses, uh, then all of a sudden what you're looking at uh, is something that, you know, can become very valuable to you. Uh, perhaps not in an economic sense, um, but, you know, uh, but that, poten I mean, that, that potential exists there too. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't know how many breeders were selecting for high CBD content 20 years ago. Um, but Seriously. all of a sudden, all of a sudden that, uh, that became a whole nother, uh, commercial market. And so, uh, you know, I think that that just kind of underscores a general point that I would make, which is that, you know, we're just kind of like walking along on the road, uh, with these, with these plants and we don't really know where we're going necessarily. Um, but we know that just as it has taken, uh, countless generations of ancestors before us for us to be walking along that road. The same is true for the cannabis that is walking along that road with us. And, uh, and based on that relationship, we should be doing our best to take good care of each other. Um, and I think, you know, we're all here because uh, we know um, how important and significant cannabis has been in our lives. And uh, so to the extent that we value her in that way, uh, we should also uh, strive to be um, supportive and important uh, in her life too. For sure. I think that's, I don't know if that was much about the sour diesel, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, and I think that's the beauty of the show is we can kind of go off in a direction. We can start with one thing and go off in a direction uh, yeah. that, that enlightens or opens people's mind up to the possibilities of other things. Because such a little bit, you know, there's, there's very little information about the plant that's shared. We get excited about gelatos these days, and and cookies and gelatos and these commercial brands that. Not that they don't mean a lot, but they, they mean a lot to some people. But in the grander scheme of things, cannabis is so much of a bigger thing, you know, that that we've grown along through, through the past, you know, as long as humans have been alive on this earth, we, their cannabis has been alive and, you know, evolving together. Um, so, yeah. So, guys, let's see. What else should we talk about, Jamal? I know there's some other interesting, cool stuff that you want to share. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I would just love, I mean, from last 
from last year's interview, I got two amazing, I, I got many amazing members. And, you know, I just thought it was really awesome that, you know, people that watch this show were able to connect and, um, you know, continue this journey. And so like, you know, if, if Steve is interested, I'd love for him to, you know, talk about some of the varieties that he's grown this year. There are a lot of things that people in the community talk about growing, but don't often grow. Um, I've grown some of his, or um, one of his, I guess it was an F1 from Snow High, but it was my first time growing, I guess what you consider like a true F1 hybrid. And it was the, what, Nangahar by Panama Red. And it was really um, a very different experience than most of my experiences growing cannabis. Um, what was different about it was that it had an amazing veg. It had an amazing, amazing structure. But um, this is actually something that me and Steve have gone back and forth about. But for me, it, it kind of fluffed out in this really like loose, loose way. Um, but at the same time, the terpenes on it, I would just argue they were like, kind of raw. How would you describe this, Steve? I mean, I think people would really get, get a kick out of that. Yeah, I mean, it was a really interesting plant. And it was, it's, to me, to describe it, it's almost like just a giant Afghani, like the, the Panama influenced this Afghani. So it was just like a 15 foot tall indica plant. It was just amazing. And yeah, the in flower, I was getting a lot of perfumey, chocolatey aroma, which was really interesting. It didn't really carry through to the cure. Um, kind of lost a lot of that in the cure. It's that that was one of the plants that got some powdery mildew, and I believe that you know that, that's the Afghani influence on on the sativa. That was one of them that had Afghani in it, and sure enough, it got PM. Uh, whereas the same mother on other plants did did not do that, or same father did not do that. Um, a lot of what I'm looking for and buying or kind of searching through these lines is for that psychedelic, more motivational type of high. I'm actually breeding for the high, which I find is kind of hard to do. And I don't hear it discussed a whole lot because especially with a lot of these sativas, I don't feel like the high really develops until a really good cure. And I'm talking six to six weeks to two months is where really I'm feeling the power come out in some of these. And it's really easy to just discount them as weak before that and toss them away. So um, just as a musician type artist person, that that's what I'm looking for is something to motivate me. And that's what I'm missing in a lot of strains in the last 20 years is something that gets me off the couch and actually puts a lot of creativity into my brain and these strains do it. And I, I've proven it, you know, this year I've <laughs> been my most creative year ever. And, and it's something that I'm really exploring more is trying to hone in on how to selectively breed for the high. And I'm finding a lot of, it's really easy to say these are heady but um there's more to it than that and I, I do think there's something like thcv that could be influencing what i'm looking for and that's that's what why i'm looking in the panama reds um i i just heard a lot of that that they've tested for high and thcv i and when i find one I'm, i'll have it tested and see if i can prove that but um i'm searching in a lot of those you know really narrowly um varieties because that's kind of what I grew up with. I, I remember smoking Thai stick and Acapulco gold in the early 80s and it was really powerful weed and, and psychedelic like close to mushrooms and in the years since we've hybridized things I think the Afghani influence has taken over that part of the, the high and that's why I'm trying to look more in just pure sativas and breed with nothing but you know hybridized pure sativas to to retain that because it definitely is a different 
if you don't give it a chance, you might overlook it. And if you smoke a sativa and then follow it up with a indica because you're not feeling the high, you, you also might miss it because it's a longer on, onset sometimes as well. So. Nice. Good stuff. Well, let's get back to some stuff with uh, Grasshopper. We haven't heard a lot from him, and I'm sure he's got a lot to share. So you want to tell us about some of your current breeding projects, Grasshopper? Sure, dude. Um, uh, I'm always working on some stuff. Um, you know, over the past 12 years, it seems like, you know, I try to do at least three or four outcrosses or preservations every year. Um, and um, last year, my focus was on a, a 1987 Gobi from the Gobi Desert. We call it the Gobi. And um, another uh, heirloom that I've been focused on is an heirloom that uh, a relative of mine had collected in Hawaii in um, 2013. I kept those around for a while and um, finally popped them about four or five years ago and I was totally amazed by those. So I've just been breeding those back and forth, bouncing different things off of them to see, you know, if they pass the traits on that I like or the, the traits that, you know, is attractive to me. Um, and I find out that they are passing on those traits, uh, the Gobi as well. Um, how the Gobi came about was the 87 uh, military dude had that strain. Uh, he brought like three or four seeds back with him from some parts of India, but the seeds, according to him, they came from the Gobi. In, the, in that area. Um, and they're pretty impressive. I've grown some, some Mazar and different Afghanis and different things and from that region. And um, these things are kind of the most impressive I've seen so far when it comes to uh, heirloom type. So I'm really happy with those. I'm looking forward to continue working with those and I'm probably releasing them at some point. And, um, you know, beside that, I have the regular, my regular harem with just about six to eight strains that I would bounce a lot of things off of. Every time I'm doing a a, pollin a, a preservation or an open pollination, I would throw a urkelin, throw some OG, some mango, some cherries. And, and then during um, like last year, what I did was open pollinated the Hawaiian and then um, selected the best two males and the best two females from those. And I was getting out of the Hawaiians, I'm getting like, like mango carrot, I'm getting some like ripe guava. I mean, they're pretty, pretty unique. So, uh, and those are the kind of heirlooms that I'm attracted to as opposed to the more terpenaline and the more, you know, earthy limonene. Uh, so, you know, those is what I've been working on. Um, and um, last year, I also did a, a 82 Durban preservation. I had a couple of dozens of those seeds for, some, for a couple of years and had to get into those and open them up. And those were interesting as well. I see licorice phenos. I see, I see um, uh, some anise phenos in there. And this is a, this line, I got it from I think it's Brother Mendel some years ago, and he, he it's the Ed Rosenthal, Ed Rosenthal's um, 82 Durban. From what I'm understanding, that's the one they took over to Europe and crossed it with super silver and then made the poison. Um, so it's like, it doesn't really have any indica influence in, in it. It's, it's, a, it's a wispy, not very large bud, but very, very high terpene plant. Um, so those are what I've been working on, crossing the Durbans, out crossing them, um, and and different things. And of course, I do a lot of the runs by Durbans and runs by Hawaiian, <laughs> purples by Hawaiians. And you know, right now I'm focusing on the Gobi. This year I'm focusing on um, pulling up the Gobi. I you know I had photos of it that we were trying to get ready to show today, but unfortunately it didn't work out. But you know, with my experience growing. Um, 
land races or what we are heirloom those have been the most attractive for me like i you know um i have a lot of other stuff that's from the source like for instance um the senegals i have some some uh malawi some swazi that my family they collect from those places and send to me but you know um everything takes time and so i just kind of keep them tuck away i might be going off tangent a little bit here but um yeah i have friends in like germany who who, who call me asking about specific strains from Senegal and certain region in Senegal because they're discovering uh, TACT and that's one of their focus right now is to catch a kind of a trial or something like that. So there's a lot of cool stuff that I would like to look at and see what, what's in store and what, what's, the, what's the components within them. Um, yeah. Um, as breeding Goya yeah, is always something, it's, it's hard to say specific because I'm all over with it. Um, I breed just about, you know, a lot of open pollinations, a lot of the, a lot of what we call the exotics, because those kind of, you know, move a little bit faster than, than the, than some of the land races and stuff. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of cool lines over the years and those have been my focus recently though. They, they, the Hanale, which is the Hawaiian, the Gobi, I'm really excited about that. I'm getting like some sulfur and garlic and some kind of funk from, from that. Um, very, very unique um, plant. Um, the, like for instance, the Gobi finishes <coughs> end of September and it tests up to like 26%. It's a mad indica. I've never grown an indica like that. Um, and it veg pretty good. Um, so I'm doing like the Gobi onto the Urko, the Gobi onto the OG. I actually crossed the Gobi with my OG BX, you know, 88 G13, OG, OG, and then back into OG BX2 by Gobi. And those were pretty impressive plants. Um, really, like, did some amazing things to the coach side of it. Um, very right. similar. And yeah. That, that's that's kind of where I'm at with the breeding projects these days. Nice. So I want to talk about something that's going on in the chat, and you know, because we're all a little bit older. I'm in my 40s. I'm in mid 40s as of friggin' two weeks from now. I'll be 45. But uh, skunk and cat piss and some of these varieties that we got to experience when we are younger are gone. And I keep hearing seed companies have it. I've got the road killer. I've got the skunk. The, you know, the, the skunk one is definitely not skunk that we know as super skunky. Um, although it's it's great in its own sense, skunk number one has been used for a lot of stuff. What happened to the, the real skunk skunk? We can call it roadkill. We can call it whatever. But, you know, uh, back at shows in the day, you go to freaking dead shows, Shakedown Street, you'd smell that skunk like a mile away. You'd smell it. It was super intense. Super amazing, yeah, very acquired taste because it smelled straight up like the friggin' skunk, like a skunk had been sprayed, um, you know. And it wasn't like gas, like fuel, like chemi. It was skunk, like skunky, and that's been gone for a long time. What do you guys think happened? Um, we can start with Steve. Uh, I think, Walter. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> definitely. I I smoked skunk for the first time in '81, and it was still probably the strongest best weed I've ever smoked. I, I will never forget that high. So ever since then, I've been looking for it and I have never found that one again. I, it's been skunky. Yeah. And, um, and I grew up near Santa Cruz and I would, from 78 to 81, I would smell skunk anytime I was driving in the hills. So, <laughs> and I'm, I'm pretty sure that wasn't a skunk every time. But <laughs> right. Absolutely. As things went indoors, I think, I mean, I know so many people that got popped for, for smell. So yeah. it, it, once you've got a fruity strain or something else that, that would sell that didn't get you busted, it was no, that's no decision to make at all. So, I mean, hopefully people held on to the seeds, but I've never seen them again. And actually back in those days when I was smoking that skunk, I never found one seed in that stuff. So 
Yeah. I just think, and as fruity strains became popular, they were just, wow, I've never tasted anything like blueberry and wheat. And it became like this thing where a lot of people didn't look back. And it wasn't until a decade or so later that people started going, wow, I wish I had skunk again, you know? Right. And then by this time it was like, well, where is it? And everyone keeps on claiming it. The first time I, I was at those dead shows too. I was in, you know, I went to a lot of shows from late eighties to till the end. And I watched that chem pop up in the parking lot too. And it was close to the skunk, but not quite, you know, one. And as that chem took over, I, and OG, that was all over the lot everywhere in the nineties. Right. And I started seeing less and less like Oregon purple tie and kind bud, you know, that kind of stuff. So totally. I just, I just think indoor growing has a lot to do with it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see. How about a uh, grasshopper? What's your thought on it? Well, I, I think I came around a little bit too late. I, I guess I missed out on the, um, on the skunk train. Um, yeah. My experience is that I had done a lot of the Sensi, the Sensi skunk, like the Ultra, the Super, and the skunk one. Um, and I, my experience with it was it, it, they, were, they were a type of more sweeter as opposed to skunky. It's, I, I guess a train, but, you know, growing the Sensi skunks, uh, by that time, I guess, it, you know, that stuff has already been... Yeah, yeah, the Sensi skunk was all sweet. It was a very sweet notes, and and the skunk that I experienced from all the European companies was the sweet stuff. Yeah, uh, that's my as well. I I I wasn't here in the eighties, so I really can't speak on on that um sort of kill. But, you know. We'll get to Jamal last because he's the youngest. Gordon, what do you have to say about skunk? Well, uh, yeah, I. I came around a little bit later than that too, I guess. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't smoking flowers in the eighties. Um, cause I was mostly under 10 for that decade. So, um, the, uh, but like, where do I think it went? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, I think that the, uh, you know, the indoor thing, uh, yeah. I, I, I could see that being a huge influence on it. Um, and, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those things that for whatever reason at the time, the people who were holding on to it either chose to go with something different you know, something, you know, for whatever consideration, like, oh, it does better indoors, or, you know, this is what my people want, or, you know, however, that, uh, that storyline went. And it's one of those things that, you know, I guess ties in a little bit earlier with uh, the, the comment, I think, uh, you know, that, uh, that well let's see there, there was i guess one thing i wanted to tie into was uh what grasshopper was saying earlier about the 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 personal relationships in the in the maintenance of you know these different land race varieties um and i guess also what you know jamal was saying about trying to understand uh, if all of these different heirlooms or land races need preservation, um, because, you know, I mean, we could, we could easily be, you know, uh, 30 years in the future, looking back on the time now and, you know, wondering where, you know, I, or, I mean, even just now looking back, it's like, yeah, we could, you know, we could talk about the skunk or, or the cat piss or any number of strains that like we don't know of them around anymore. Haven't seen them in years or decades uh, is like, you know, we don't we don't always necessarily know, uh, you know, what the future holds as far as what we consider uh 
desirable or valuable. And uh, so just, you know, I guess as we're, as we're taking care of the seeds is like, you know, keeping that, uh, that perspective, of course, there are limitations to how much any uh, of us as individuals can do. Um, but that's, I mean, one thing I, I, I really appreciate uh, what Jamal's got going on down there. Um, and, you know, we've engaged in this uh, in a lot of ways uh, outside of the cannabis sphere in, in, in other crop types uh is like you know we operate like a seed preservation farm here um the but the scope of seed preservation is it, it, it i mean it's it's just massive like it's huge uh it, it it's not something that you could do with any like small group of people or in any singular location uh you know like when we're looking at all this diversity of like whether you know whether it's equatorial stuff or whether it's uh central asian stuff or south asian or southeast asia it's like that like you know all of those places also need to be engaged in taking care you know of their seed uh like you know, if we are growing out uh, equatorial varieties here in California, uh, well, it's different. We just made it different already. We haven't even, you know, like we, we haven't even harvested any seed or anything yet. And like, it's already different because it's a different environment. We're, we're at a different latitude. We have different, you know, it doesn't rain in the summer here. Uh, you know, there's all these different things. So it's like, uh, sure. That's, that's one, a I, I guess one thing that I would just emphasize in that is that it's like, it's none of it is static. Uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's moving all the time. And I, I guess, yeah, again, I can't really speak to what happened to the skunk particularly as like as far as like how did it actually go down. Uh, but I think what we can sort of surmise at this point is that it slipped through our fingers. You know, like it wasn't anything that I ever held in my hands personally. It wasn't, you know, literally my fingers, but like for us as cannabis growers and stewards, uh, you know, collectively, yeah, it slipped through our fingers and, and it is far from the only one. I mean, Oh God, I, I, you know, I mean, I'm sure everybody on here has got plenty of stories about stuff that they were trying to keep yeah. that got away from them. Uh, you know, and that is part of the nature of the thing. Uh, you know, and, and I mean, I guess, you know, for myself in a certain regard, I don't, uh, I don't know that that's uh, cataclysmic, you know, there are uh, forces at work that I might not necessarily understand uh, for, you know, uh, or it might just be user error, you know, uh, that whole spectrum of possibilities open as well. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think it just emphasizes the point of, uh, you know, it, it's easy to imagine being in the future and looking back and being like, man, you know, in whatever, 2021 here is like, we were all about the gelato and the cookies and all this kind of other stuff. But, you know, if that's, you know, if that's all that we're left with in another 30, 50, 100 years, uh, then we missed the point. Uh, I, and, and I think we, you know, I think we dropped the plot of the of the story. And we, so, uh, you know, trying to hold on to those things and not just in that like, oh, I've got some old skunk seeds in the freezer or something i'm pretty sure that's what they are but no like uh like in in situ in situation like in in active use uh 
Uh, and I guess I'll just tie that up back to that uh, point that Grasshopper was making earlier is that it's like, these are family relationships. Uh, you know, the, the, this is, you know, like these are, uh, you know, I mean, every one of us, you know, for everybody that's eaten today, uh, which is all of us, uh, we all have seed to thank for that. Um, so like our ability and, uh, attention, uh, to caring for the seeds that are in our lives is, uh, is really important because it is that easy for stuff to, you know, it, it's, it's just not around anymore. Um, yeah, but I also, but I would also say in that, that I think, uh, that with time and attention and, uh, you know, a lot of work and some generation, uh, you could find your way back. Um, you know, you could find your way back to, to those ones and it might not be exactly how you remembered it, but probably most of the eighties aren't exactly how you remember them either. So, right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I think a lot of people think uh, and there's some people that have never experienced skunk and are like, well, it's just like chem. And it's like, well, I think it comes from the same place like a thiol, you know, because thiols are kind of like terpenes. They're smaller molecules that give you that pissy ammonia or the, the burnt rubber or those, uh, you know, fuely kind of smells. But skunk was in my recollection, skunk. You know, and my memory could be lying to me, but I, I absolutely remember skunk growing up. And when I was, uh, you know, 14, 15, it was before I even had a driver's license. My friend would drive. Down, maybe I was 16, but I didn't have a driver's license then. But we used to drive down to Santa Cruz and we paid $60 an eighth straight up. And they called it strawberry, but there was no strawberry about it. It was straight skunk. And it was called strawberry because the nugs were strawberry sized nuggets. So you'd get three in a bag and they were all strawberry shaped. But it was the skunkiest skunk stuff you could smell, and it was so strong, and it, it just – we couldn't get enough of it. So whatever we could get together, whether it was an eighth or whether it was 120 bucks or, or enough for an ounce even, we've, we, we used to go down there and get this amazing bud. But, man, it's, it's kind of it's, – it's sad, and it's also, you know, a, a challenge. You know, if, we, if people want this back, I think it's possible to get it back. But uh, let's talk about phenotypes because – just because you have seeds of something, even if the person who had it made seeds, doesn't mean that it's going to express because of recessive traits. It's going to express the way we we want it to. It's going to do what the plant wants it to do. You know, it, we're not in control of those things always. We can kind of guide it in a way and hope to get lucky or successful. And it, it, the more you know the plant, the more you're going to be able to see. But like with skunk, maybe it's a super recessive trait, and I would assume that it is because we don't have it now. What's your take on that, Jamal? Since I know you weren't around when the skunk was right. How old are you? You're, you're in your 30s? I'm 39. You're 39. You look young. So Thank that's you. good. Yeah, no, I, I've never I've never smoked skunk or roadkill skunk. Um, I mean, my take on it is that these certain ter terpene profiles are like pop culture phenomena. And I don't believe that they're in one specific cutting that was the roadkill skunk. I believe that there were a certain grouping of genetics that were expressing a certain, you know, range of terpene profiles, maybe similar to now cookies or gas. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's really my take on it. I, I agree, like with large enough populations, it should be back in there. You know, you should be able to find it. It shouldn't like ever be lost. It's just how many seeds you're going to look through to find it. Um, and, you know, like a lot of like, seems like to me, like what breeding is, is like, like we first, we started with our heirlooms, then we did our baseline hybrids and then polyhybrids, then complex polyhybrids, then these super complex and then more and more complex polyhybrids. So it seems like we're almost trying to like slow it down a little bit or like, like like bring the genetics a little bit back to what they used to be. Um, but as the more I'm learning this, I'm not sure if you really can ever bring it back to where it used to be, but really just move it on another direction. 
Um, and so, I mean, that's my vague answer regarding roadkill. I mean, it seems like a lot of people who are scamming claim to have roadkill. Yeah. I'm hopeful that um, the goby that grasshopper has been growing, I'm, you know, he's, um, I'm hopeful that that has some roadkill terps in it. But I mean, I, you know, as somebody who's never experienced it, I really hesitate to say that I'm the one that knows where it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, everybody knows the smell because it's a skunk smell. Okay. If you smell a skunk, it is straight. It's, as much as a skunk can be skunk smell, it's that almost like nose burning skunk, skunk smell that burns your nose. And I, I, uh, I haven't smoked yeah, that. We can breed for it because we all know what it smells like. So it's just, it's, it's going to take time to find something that yeah. appeases all these old guys. Yeah, we're, who knows how old we're going to be by the time we figure it out. But <laughs> I, I think it, it'll come back around, at least something that will respectfully be on that level and who knows there could be some hippie that has it stashed away somewhere you just never know yeah, you um, might, yeah. i i think you're right james it's, it seems like it's a recessive trait that's why we're having such a hard time and it's one of the reasons i <clears throat> i'm going back to what i remember right before i ever tried skunk which was thai colombian and mexican and yeah. trying to get something similar that I feel like is a background to skunk and then breed with those strains and see what comes out of it. See if I can find that recessive because I've tried many different sensi seeds, super skunk and different things that were skunky, like I said, but that first skunk I ever tried, I thought was fake. The I thought for sure a skunk had sprayed the plant. You know, it was yeah. that skunk. Absolutely. I am. Um, can I say something on that? Sure. I'd love, yeah. I'm, That'd be great. I'm, I'm hopeful as well that you know we can find some of these older stuff but um from my experience prior to you know being in this space um it's like there was a there was a war on drugs and you know there was like in some regions where i'm from there were programs called operation eradication you know the you know there were projects set up to actually eradicate the plant um and from my experience with it is that you would have some families that would have some really really unique stuff and you know in those like in central america is the within is the um, indigenous and the natives that really you know produce herbs for the rest of the population and um you will find out that you know there's some years that for two three four five six years you could go to this one family and you get this great herb all the time every time and then you know, operation eradication comes in and shut them down bust them wipe them out throw them in jail and then you never see those things again you know right. that family had a lot of my experience with what's happening with some of those things from abroad because the war on drugs also didn't affect here it affect all the baselines of what we need to create what we had here you know like you know, you go to Colombia and Central America and all of these places, different parts of the world, you know, we were paying them to cut their herb down and to turn them to be Christian. Um, mm -hmm. So it's kind of those things where I've seen things that was really great for a long time and those families get shut down. And those families have been like, you know, breeding them and steering those things into the directions that they wanted to. Um, not that I'm saying that they don't exist, but I still remain very hopeful because of the war on drugs and what it did, not just to the perimeters within the United States, but worldwide, you know, and we, most of what we have, we have imported in the 70s and the 80s to build what we have, and now we're trying to go back to those places to grab the baselines or the, or the original um, genetics that make up some of the stuff, but those countries have been totally impacted by the war on drugs, worse so than we have here. You know, they were to the point where stuff was about to be eradicated totally. And so that's just my take on it. I still remain hopeful that we could see some of these things come back around. Yeah, for sure. And to all those youngins that think that the weed is the best it's ever been, you know, I've been smoking since 91. And there was skunk in 91, 92. Early, we had skunk in, in the early 90s. I haven't seen it since the early 90s. But the weed back then was phenomenal. 
Uh, I would say there's less people growing it. It was more dangerous. And the quality on average was a lot better. I wouldn't say, you know, the genetics, there wasn't the diversity that we have now available. But, man, the smoke was good. It was freaking, you know, it, it made me fall in love with cannabis. The cat piss is what made me fall, absolutely fall in love with cannabis was the cat piss, but several varieties. So if you guys are young and you think the weed is the best it's ever been, the weed's been great for a long time. You know, we've we've made it more diverse. We've made it higher in THC. We've done a lot of interesting things with it, but it's it's not necessarily the best it's ever been. It's a... Uh, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. It's an evolution. So, yeah. What do you guys think about that? No, I'm one of those old guys. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I have friends that work at dispensaries and they bring me some of the latest, greatest, and it looks great. It might even have a good flavor, but it, uh, it lacks something that we had back then. Um, the weed was very good back then. And like you said, in, in the early 90s, if uh, when it was Ill, illegal to grow, you, you wanted to grow the best. And it just made everyone, and you wanted to grow something unique too. It wasn't yeah. all the same. Yeah, I see yeah. people saying it's all mids now. That's that's not true because you can go to Washington in metric and you can go to House of Cultivar and buy their stuff. Uh, Canna Organics, uh, there's, there's a couple other brands up there, but I would say you can get their stuff and it's grown really well and it's amazing. And, you know, I think that there are places in Colorado that have good metric cannabis. There's some in California. There's a, there's a few, but I, you know, and it's, you know, we're, we're slowly coming into this uh, legalization and decriminalization. And, you know, so I, I would assume that it's going to get better. It still has the possibility of getting better. Um, you know, yeah, what do you, sure. what do you guys, yeah. And the more home growing to, to push the commercial market into stepping up their game, I think would help too. I mean, if, if people start seeing what, what is not on the market and going in that direction, then it'll force them to, to put something in there that doesn't look, you know, like a lot of the modern stuff looks today. It can be a little bit wispy, you know? Right. Yeah, and um, I got this all good stuff in Mexico. Amazing stuff in Mexico, guys. And I remember that cat piss too. And I remember that strawberry buddy you were talking about too. So yeah. I mean, um, that was phenomenal weed. I, I it's hard to find stuff. That, that I don't see anything like that in the dispensaries at all. And and with the stickiness either. Right. It seems like the resin now is a lot drier and those sticky buds that remain sticky for months that I'm I'm seeing that in more of the hazes and sativas. Yeah. I mean, for sure that greasy stuff, even sour, like when it's real greasy, but uh, I remember stuff that was so greasy. Our, we used to have a test where we'd take it and put it in our thumb and stick it against glass. And that was the test. Like if it would stick to the glass, once you take your thumb off, that was the greasy, greasy. Yeah. Stream. And, and I mean, it was like, if it was in a, in a bag, like it always was back then, it would just stick to the, I mean, it was sugar coated bags back then because it was so sticky, you know. Yeah, sticky, yeah, sticky, and ter and even the I think the grease is from the terps, and then the stickies from the trikes. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but yeah, man, but greasy. Was, You're right, greasy. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, yeah, I'm also sticky. I mean, you, you touch it for a second, you get it all over your hands, and then you're rubbing little hash miniature hash balls. Yeah, rolling a joint was difficult sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like the guys. So uh, Silas, he's uh, his Instagram is always running dank, and he grows living soil. He grows specifically. I haven't talked to him in a little while, but he grows specifically for extract, for making rosin and bubble and rosin. And his stuff, I love it so much. But you can you can't roll most of it in joints because it's so sticky and so resinous. Uh, you know, makes great extract, but it's tough. And I love the way it looks and smells. It's one of those ones where you can't put it down. You got to keep smelling the jar. Uh, but yeah, he does live. It's hundred percent living soil that he's done and he's you know, a phenomenal grower, but he definitely gears it more for stuff to uh, do extract with. So I remember stuff back in the day. That was that's like that's interesting. Stuff. I've, I tried to extract some of this greasy stuff and it doesn't work as well. It's, it's well, great. it depends. So like there's some of the stuff that, is greasy like sour diesel is a great example it makes 
uh, extract that's very, very greasy and it doesn't yield nearly like GMO, where GMO has a ton of trichomes and it's not only the size of the trichome heads, but, uh, you know, the stickiness of it. It's not quite as sticky as those sour diesel terps. I think it, because it's so terpy with the sour diesel, the true sour, that it doesn't make excellent hash. But it, it makes okay hash. Whereas like something like GMO or some of these other varieties, man, they just dump hash and it's it's like so, you know, Gordon and I were talking about hash varieties, you know, like breeding for hash varieties, and that's that's something that's on the horizon for sure. Oh uh, yeah, definitely. I um you know, I I was kind of just waiting to jump back in here because I wanna uh also bring up another idea that uh kicks around in my head around the land race conversation and particularly talking about like people growing at home and you know one of the things when you know if you're talking about land race or heirloom is you know you 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 have this you know this population uh you know there there's there's a a degree of diversity that exists within you know, any land race or heirloom uh, seed lot. Um, you know, you're not, you're not getting this uniform uh, as if it were uh, an F1 hybrid. Um, and so like other, like other than, uh, you know, than, than the fact that we're, uh, you know, like, I guess what makes an heirloom or a land race that beyond that general characteristic is that it's something that somebody's been taking care of in some place for some period of time. Uh, and so typically we're thinking of these as being old. Um, you know, I guess, you know, having heirloom uh, as, a, as a synonym in there uh you know has this like well this is something that's old and the only way that uh you know that we could find something like that is to go look in the past for something that's old and uh and i think that that is actually like narrows our understanding of the possibility um and so i guess the idea that i have in that is like imagine that you were to create your own land race and that you have your land race that you take care of. And that is, uh, you know, particular and distinct, uh, to, you know, to, to, to your place, to your farm, uh, to, to your community whom, you know, whomsoever is involved in, uh, in the growing of this, uh, of this population. Um, and I don't know, I, like, is there a, a, a technical number of generations that have to go by before you can say that something is a land race? Or is there uh, a degree of stability that you have to be able to see in the line before you can say it's a land race? Um, I'm not sure. I think that, uh, you know, maybe somebody specified that. I don't have a technical answer so. for that question. But... No, that is uh, to me the 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 possibility of you know of recreating circumstances like that of or, of of creating uh, you know it's 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 like I'm just creating tomorrow's heirlooms now I'm creating tomorrow's land races now and. You know, we are at a point in time where we do, you know, uh, we do have a, a collection that has been amassed from around the world. All this stuff has been imported from all these places, like Grasshopper was just saying, places where they don't have it there necessarily anymore uh, because of, you know, the imperialist world that we live in. Um, so uh what are like if if we're folding those things uh in from all over the world which is what we've been doing already 
uh, you know, that's not anything new uh, per se. Um, so, you know, again, if it's like, oh, there's there's a certain there's a certain ter terpene profile that I really like. And so I want to find some things that are like that. And then I want to see what comes out and I want to, you know, I want to, and I want to be connected with other people who are doing that and, uh, you know, have, a. I think it's important to keep a level of interaction in the seed sphere, uh, that isn't, that isn't, uh, commercialized. Right. Um, because that is, is very much where, uh, you know, this is, this is all the scale of all this is so much bigger than any one person or one place or one community. Like, okay, so we're here in California. Like, okay, that's great. California. Uh, how many regions are there? Uh, you know, microclimates and all that within California. Oh God, it's Insane. endless, you know, and 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 we haven't even left california yet you know the same is true when you go to oregon the same is true when you go you know wherever anywhere uh so uh, i think that keeping that diversity really like churning and spinning uh is possible and i think that you know i mean one of the ways that i uh look at the work that I'm doing here is, you know, there, there is a, uh, uh, a seed line that I'm uh, working with that is, is just kind of like a little bit of everything. Uh, it's all in there. Um, and I don't make selections out of that line uh, at this point in time, at least you know, uh, I mean, I have out of different open population uh, uh, crosses, but like, uh, you know, just like what happens, you know, when you when you allow all of these things to mingle, uh, you know, am I finding traits that I find desirable? Well, I may or may not. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of this like, uh, Genesis point, uh, where you have this, this seed lot that is just got really staggering potential. Right. Yeah. The, the, Sky is the limit with the potential. Yeah, like you can find, you know, it, it, it's like if it, you, you've got stuff from all over the world in there, and then you have the interaction of stuff from all over the world in there. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, you know, like you don't, you don't necessarily have to be like a commercial grower to, uh, to have that kind of uh, a relationship where you're you're maintaining a seed lot that is um, is either you know just for you or it is for you know some time eventuality out into the future. Uh, you know, you may or may not even be around uh, when. You know, somebody decides that they want to go looking into, uh, you know, what what is in that collection of seeds. Um, uh, but that, like, everything that we have now comes from something, somebody doing something like that at some point in time. Sure. Absolutely. So I want to touch on one thing. I, Full Circle 72, a couple minutes ago, said land race equals what we perceive as untouched strange actually has been crossed for 4,000 years. That's not necessarily what a land, land race, that would be more feral. You know, land race is something that's been taken by somebody and adapted for a specific need. And I think that's the best way to put Jamal. 
wouldn't what would you you know as far as land race that that's pretty much you can go to our gordon anywhere in the world you can find some you know land race varieties you go over india there's varieties that they've been cultivating and and harnessing and using for a specific purpose that they've you know it's not necessarily something feral that's completely untouched um, yeah I, I would argue that there there is a difference between a feral cannabis and land race absolutely um I like the term point of origin. Um, I mean, I believe, because there's many different de descriptions of this, but that a land race is like a deeper heirloom. So like heirloom, I, I believe the, the definition was like it needed to be grown the same place for 100 years. 50, I believe. Okay. 50. Yeah. 50. Um, so my understanding is that a land race would be something that is acclimatized to a specific location has been grown there for you know for many generations um and i mean it also seems like it's like kind of a thing of like western that like a way of westerners that we would describe other cultures genetics you know that are quote unquote less more primitive in a way um but i mean really it's just you know genetics that are acclimatized to a specific region and they've been grown there for a certain amount of time. And so they have certain characteristics that are extremely dominant. I mean, to me, that's really what it comes down to. And, you know, the main dominant traits that I usually observe are vigor, hardiness, um, really strong root structure, um, pest resistance, mold resistance, just a very tough wild plant almost like a like a caveman of a plant so it's a bit rough around the edges but is really um it's bred to survive and you know whenever i grow those types of genetics i always find i have to give them much less attention much less staking fertilizing all of those things there it's just like a wilder version and like a really good example that i tried to give to people is like, for example, apples. You know, you can see a wild apple tree, you can taste a wild apple, they're tinier, um, they're usually not sweet, they're kind of bitter, and there's a lot of them. And the trees are extremely strong as compared to a cameo apple or whatever type of apple tree, which, you know, um, as, you know, needs a lot more care for the apples to be successful. Nice. Gordon, you want to touch on that at all? Well, I think yeah, I uh, I, I agree with the uh, the land race definition there, and I think that apples are a pretty good analogy um, in their you know in their in, like their diversity. Like apples are so exceptionally diverse, um, and uh yeah i guess the 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 point in in which you know where i was really going with that is like uh you know like start your own land race basically yeah right yeah they could be passed on generation to generation so i guess we, mm -hmm. we only got a couple minutes left we have about seven minutes here and i want to discuss nomenclature because I think uh, it's an important topic. I think something that should be discussed more, you know, because I think we have indica sativa hybrid as the base for what the the average person knows as cannabis. When, uh, you know, you can have something with a sativa structure that expresses indica characteristics, vice versa. How do you guys feel about the, the term indica sativa hybrid? And do you think we should be using equatorial, tropical, narrow leaf drug varietals wide leaf drug varietals what what are your thoughts on that guys i guess grasshopper we haven't heard from you in a minute let's uh you have an opinion yeah sure um you know yeah, personally is going to take a transition within the community and um but you know at this point you know communicating and understanding each other have been, you know, we stuck with those, with the older terminologies or the ones that we made up. Um, 
Yeah, and I do agree that we should advance. We should move forward and get more scientific with it. And I think yeah. it's, going to, you know, shows like these and exactly what you're doing right now to, to expand on that and open the conversation and start educating the broader public and the community about what's scientifically appropriate. Just be my take. Jamal? Yeah, I mean, I still use indica and sativa, but I feel like narrow and wide, narrow leaf and wide leaf drug type seems like the best description. Um, but you know, it's tough because I mean, if you like when you break into a pack of seeds, you might have different phenos that you know some have terpenes that are sativa effect and some that have you know indica quote unquote effects from the same same genetics. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I just use wide leaf or narrow leaf drug type, you know, if if people need a better description. Um, but I think the most important part, like what everybody else is, is saying, is that it's important to have the conversation because before this, you know, it was originally like kind bud. There wasn't even a name for the strain. It was just weed. Um, and so, like, as we develop our vocabulary in, the, you know, in this industry, you know, and then we had terps and everything is terps now. Um, you know, as we develop the, the vocabulary, I think that we'll find something that makes the most sense. Uh, but I, you know, it's, it's so hard. It, it's, it's hard. It's a hard one. Yeah. Steve, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think <clears throat> we're on the right path uh, with educating what this channel does. And what you're doing is definitely educating people about terpenes and the different effects it is on the right path. It, it's hard. I think in a commercial market to sell some someone, especially someone that's not too familiar, how to describe it. You know, it's like you got the up effect and you got the down effect. That's as close as people are getting in the commercial market. But we all know there's a huge gray area in between. And um, I think wide leaf, narrow leaf is closer. I mean, I think there needs to be a lot of education to in the commercial market before anything's going to change like that. But I, I do remember when we were smoking sativas and all of a sudden when Indica, that's all we ever called it and came in. And then that's all I wanted for a long time was nothing but Indica. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's been around for a long time and it's going to be, I don't know how we're going to educate people and get people out of that train of thought, because we all know it's, we know as growers that it's, it's wrong slowly but surely is all i can yeah. think and then you know part of the reason i asked this question was uh to talk with gordon about our mutual friend and partner jason and his flavor wheel but what are your opinions gordon on uh, the indica sativa hybrid well i think it's uh i i think anytime we try and put something into a binary like that especially like a whole you know i mean there's uh, you know all the i mean there's still controversy i guess and and here we are having the conversation about it of like you know what's like the proper classification uh you know are we going to start identifying subspecies like you know there's like we're 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 trying to classify uh, a very broad spectrum and I, I think that sure for you know at this point of you know we've got uh cannabis kind of coming out of the shadows in a certain regard uh and so here's this very simple binary system that people can use to to at least kind of point the finger into the direction of well these are really diverse and there's like all kinds of different effects that they may have and that's an entirely subjective experience too by the way uh so something that is one way for one person might be different for somebody else uh you know it, it is i i mean again i think what everybody's saying is that that uh you know as the as the conversations continue as the uh the relationship between cannabis and uh you know and and those who appreciate uh cannabis goes uh you know that 
you know, our, our possibility of, of, of more subtle and nuanced language uh, is, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, a, a huge range of, of, of potential there. Uh, and, you know, and, and how far any given person wants to interact with that is just, you know, sort of commensurate with their relationship uh, with cannabis and, and, you know, how important is it to them? How much do they care? Uh, do they, do they want to take the time to be involved uh, in those conversations? Um, so for those of us to whom that is interesting, uh, I think having the conversation, uh, making some, you know, some proposals. I mean, yeah, you know, sativa, indica, narrow leaf, broad leaf, uh, you know, those are, uh, you know, those are appropriate terms because they, you know, and, and they do uh, carry significance and, and serve as a, you know, fairly effective classification, uh, but it is a binary. Uh, and so, you know, as we know, there's a, a you know, there's a lot of spectrum. So how much, how much languaging do we want to develop around that spectrum? Right. No, great answers from everybody, man. Really appreciate all you guys today. Uh, it's 101. So I think we're going to close on that note, but I would like to say, uh, that I appreciate everybody that's donated or, or purchased from my parents' uh, website, sweetwellnessllc.com, uh, CBD products for seeds. If you haven't got your seeds, you will be getting them. We've gone over the list of everybody that sent me copies of their receipts, and your seeds, they're either in hand or you guys have got them. We'll be doing another giveaway next week for sweetwellnessllc.com. They're now going to be sponsoring the show, so we'll figure out and discuss how that works next week. We'll get Jason on here, one of these days, let's talk about terpenes. He's uh, very good at articulating flavors and uh, you know, flavors and, and um, cannabis. So thank you guys again. Uh, let's see your Instagram for the, do you guys have an Instagram for your seed collective? Uh, no, we, we currently do not have an Instagram for the seed collective. But yours um, is Eileen yeah. Seeds. It, it's an Instagram, right? Yeah, I lease seeds the Instagram and also um, Grasshopper and I are um, going to be selling seeds on ileaseeds.com. Fantastic. And uh, Steve, yours is evergreen underscore 408 at Instagram? That's my Instagram, yep. Fantastic. And, yeah. Hold Gordon, there. Thanks, James. Yeah, for sure. Gordon, do you have an Instagram right now? Or are you in between? Uh, yeah, I'm kind of in between them now. I, I think uh, with uh, with Cultivar Alliance getting going, uh, we'll be having uh, some Instagram presence for both the Colors line and the Fountainhead line. Yeah, yeah. Gordon does some amazing breeding. I've I've really uh, I've appreciated his stuff for many years uh, since I've known our mutual friend Jason, and you know I look forward to being able to share it more on the show and. You know, we'll be at Spanibus this year and uh, do, be doing great things. So, you know, uh, thank you guys for coming on today. And I look forward to seeing you. Someone said, can we still get seeds when we purchase a sweet wellness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're going to do the giveaway next week, starting next Sunday. So thank you guys very much. Uh, I hope you have a great week. Go Niners. Um, and I look forward to talking to you all very soon. Thanks, Plus. James. Thanks, James. Thanks, Thanks, Peter. Peter. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> all right. See you all. The uh, Chiefs are spanking the Bengals right now, so not a very interesting game. Not good for you. <laughs> all right. See you, everyone.